Access to Democracy is made possible by donations from the following organizations. Thomson Reuters, a global company with expertise and insight to unravel complex situations in the areas of law, tax, compliance, government, and media. Their worldwide network of journalists and editors keep customers up to speed on relevant global events. Thomson Reuters, the answer company. The division championship Minnesota Twins are looking to go all the way to the World Series in 2024. Bolstered by inspirational shortstop Carlos Correa, a healthy Brian Buxton, and rookie phenom Royce Lewis, plus a pitching staff led by Pablo Lopez and an outstanding bullpen featuring Johan Duran, the Twins are the best bargain in the major leagues, and Target Field is the best venue in baseball. Sheridan Dulas and Kins, PA, a family and criminal defense law firm, has been serving clients in Dakota County and throughout Minnesota for over 40 years. Ranked a tier one best law firm by US News and World Report every year since 2009, Sheridan Dulas and Kins are here to help you in your most difficult life circumstances. Established in 2007, 45th Parallel Spirits was among the first 50 micro distilleries in the United States. Based in New Richmond, Wisconsin, all aspects of production occur at our facility. If you're interested in visiting and learning more about the 45th Parallel Distillery, please check our website and plan a visit to tour our facility and taste our spirits. Truestone Financial, with locations in Minnesota and Wisconsin, has proudly served as members since 1939. Truestone engages, educates, and supports its members to ensure they have the tools to empower their financial well-being. Truestone Financial, your neighborhood credit union. Learn more at truestone.org. Hello and welcome to another edition of Access to Democracy. I'm your host, Steve Francisco. Thank you for joining us today. Today we're going to be talking about a topic which seems to engender a lot of emotion and a lot of uh, uh, activity from all points of view. The issue we're going to be discussing today is immigration and also talking about refugees. And we have with us someone very knowledgeable about this topic today. It's my pleasure to welcome to Access to Democracy, Julia Decker. Julia, welcome to our program. Julia is the Policy Director for the Immigrant Law Center of Minnesota, ILCM. And tell us, what is ILCM, when was it founded, and what is its mission? So Immigrant Law Center is uh, primarily a legal service provider. We provide immigration legal services to low-income immigrants and refugees in Minnesota. It was founded in 1996, and we have been doing that work ever since then. We also engage in advocacy and also education. Advocacy at the legislature or before Congress or both? We do advocacy at all levels. So we are often looking at even local city councils, counties, mm. as well as the state legislature, and then of, of course federal government, as that is the primary place where immigration issues are going to be changed. And you have some previous history, as I understand it, with ILCM, because before you were policy director for this organization, you were a staff attorney there. I was. So I was a, a staff attorney at Immigrant Law Center of Minnesota as immediately after law school and then also as just a full-on staff attorney, um, which was broken up by a period of time when I worked as a teaching fellow at the University of Minnesota Law School. And tell us about ILCM. When was it started? Where was it started? So it started in, ILCM started in 1996 in St. Paul. It has since grown into uh, a statewide organization. We have offices in southern Minnesota, in Austin, and Worthington. We also recently opened an office in Fargo in North Dakota because of the lack of legal services in that area. And was there a particular reason that you chose those cities to open ILCM offices? One of the reasons that we wanted to have more of a statewide reach is because we have seen more and more immigrant communities growing in greater Minnesota. I think a lot of people think of immigration and immigrant and refugee issues as primarily a metro area thing, but the reality is there are many immigrant communities throughout Minnesota and they have many of the same needs that immigrants in the metro area have. 
Right, and isn't it true too, Julia, that many of the migrants who came to these agricultural communities in greater Minnesota, they came working in the agricultural industry, right? A lot of them were seasonal workers originally. There's definitely an aspect of the immigrant population who are, have come through agricultural work, other types of you know, working visas or uh, you know, um, situations, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, there are certainly also a lot of folks, and this is something that we may talk about a little bit more later, but people who are fleeing various situations and may have known somebody in Minnesota, mm -hmm. and that gave them a little bit of a base from which to start basically a new life. Incentive to come here. So tell our viewers, if you would, about where do your clients come from? I think some people may have the mistaken notion that they all come from Mexico. That's not true, is it? Definitely not. There, is, there are certainly many immigrants in Minnesota from Mexico, but many of our clients and immigrants in Minnesota come from places like Somalia, places like China, lots of different places throughout the world. There are many factors in many different countries that often push people to leave their homes and come to the United States. And those are not specific to one country or another or one demographic or another. Mm -hmm. How many attorneys do you have that work at ILCM? So we've got a lot of attorneys. Uh, we've also got a lot of accredited representatives, which are folks who are accredited by the government to do a lot of the same work that attorneys do. Um, and then we also have a number of legal assistants who provide really important support work to the attorneys who are doing the legal work. I saw some information on your website that I thought was very interesting. Many of your attorneys, actually most of the attorneys you work with, I believe, work on a pro bono basis on these cases, correct? Explain to people what does that mean when an attorney is working pro bono? Sure, so there are two aspects to sort of that factoid. Um, the first is that because we are a legal service provider, we do not, our clients do not pay us anything to provide services to them. So our attorneys who are in-house provide immigration legal services free of charge to our clients. Now they are screened for income when they first approach our office. We also have an extensive connection of pro bono attorneys who are working perhaps in firms or maybe they're in-house counsel somewhere, but they are volunteering their time to help with immigration cases. And that's a really integral part of any legal service work, including immigration work. So give us an idea, if you would, Julia, of what would a typical day for an ILCM attorney look like? What types of issues or cases would they have that they'd be dealing with? So there are a great number of different types of cases that ILCM works on. Citizenship, of course, is one. That's a big one, people getting their citizenship people getting their green cards, so people who have maybe come to the United States as refugees and now want to get their permanent residency so that they can eventually apply for citizenship. We also work with a lot of people who were victims of crimes, including victims of domestic violence, and working with them to In the get country status. where they came from, you mean? In the, in the United States. In the U.S.? Yes, oh. and so there are certain types of protections that people who suffered a crime in the United States are eligible for, but it can be very complicated, so working with those folks as well. DACA, which we can talk a little bit more yeah. about, but um, this, these are people who came to the United States or were brought to the United States as children, maybe by their parents, maybe by relatives. Let's tell people what that acronym stands for, yes, if we could. What for does sure. DACA, D-A-C-A, -A, what is that? It's, so DACA stands for Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. It's a very technical sort of term DACA, you may hear them called dreamers. Mm -hmm. um, and these are, again, young folks who arrived in the United States, not sort of through their own volition, kids that were brought here maybe even as infants. So they do not have citizenship in the United States, but they have basically lived in the United States their entire lives. And this began in 2012, I believe, under the Obama administration, but then later in the Trump administration, there were challenges. He tried to abolish DACA. What's the current status of DACA for the Dreamers? So it has gone back and forth in the courts a number of different times. And DACA as the program currently exists, as it did. However, there are groups of people who for a variety of reasons, are, even though they are in that same position as many of the Dreamers, 
who, who do hold DACA for certain reasons based on the requirements are currently not eligible. And so there is an ongoing advocacy to try and expand the people, the number of people who would be eligible for DACA because those people would be able to access work, uh, legal work authorization. Is it accurate to say that generally that we're talking about children of people who may have come to the U.S. in an undocumented status? It's possible. Uh, it's also possible that uh, for anybody who is here in the United States who does not currently have status, they might have entered the country with a certain type of status, and then that status has expired, mm -hmm. and they did not leave. So one of the sort of maybe misconceptions that people hear is that, well, everybody who's undocumented crossed the border without permission, which is not true. Many folks come to the United States with a certain type of visa that says, yes, you can enter the United States, but you have to leave at a certain time. And some people have not departed the United States within that certain amount of time. But they did not actually cross the border without permission. They right. indeed had permission. I would imagine one of the most challenging or difficult legal issues that your attorneys deal with on a daily basis would be deportation cases where uh, INS is attempting to deport someone who is in the United States Correct. These are, so uh, the old INS was actually reformed into what's oh, called right. Department of Homeland Security. That's right. Um, and Department of Homeland Security was divided up into a bunch of different sort of sub-agencies um, after 9-11. And what you have is, yes, the, a particular branch of DHS now is focused on enforcement, mm -hmm. which is the process by which identifying people and then trying to remove them, deport them from the United States. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of different ways that somebody who is in that position may be able to say, I should be allowed to stay. But it's a very technical, very legalistic process, and a lot of times people in that position are held in a jail, so they aren't able to access a lot of resources. And so being able to access, being able to speak with a lawyer is even potentially even more important to those folks because they have the least access to resources. And people should really understand, shouldn't they, that this is an area of the law. This is a complex area of the law. Just as uh, if you have a health care problem, you don't just say, I'm going to go to a doctor. You go to a specialist. The same is true with immigration law, isn't it? That this is really a very particular area of the law where it's constantly changing. The rules and regulations are changing. Congress is sometimes getting in the act and changing legislation. Agencies are changing legislation. Presidents are issuing executive orders, right? This is definitely correct, yes. It's a, it's a, has often been described as one of the most complex areas of law in the entire sort of US legal system, maybe second only to tax law. Hmm. So we are talking about, yes, as you, as you mentioned, Congress, the executive branch, the president. You're talking about states who are often trying to create different rules or laws around immigrants and refugees in their states. You're talking about agencies, the Department of Justice. So lots of different entities, lots of different rules and regulations to try and follow, and that mm -hmm. can come up extremely quickly. Mm -hmm. Public opinion polling in recent times seems to suggest for many voters, immigration and immigration reform is their number one issue in the upcoming elections at the federal level particularly, perhaps even at the state level. It's become a highly politicized issue. Uh, we've witnessed uh, the former president and presumptive Republican nominee for president this year. He has referred in the past to some uh, migrants as animals, rapists, and criminals. When you hear those, that kind of language being used by politicians, what is your reaction to that? So this kind of rhetoric is very unfortunate. It's very dehumanizing to I would say everybody, including but not limited to immigrants. Uh, the idea of referring to anybody with, with those types of terms is sort of inherently dehumanizing. I think the, maybe the sort of historical perspective here is that unfortunately those terms have been used throughout history for, towards a variety of newcomers to the United States. Um, so for better or for worse, this is not a new phenomenon. And it is something that certainly in our education and as immigration advocates as immigration attorneys, we really work hard to educate people around why that is such an important 
issue to address. And doesn't it seem to you too that this can be a very dangerous thing for politicians or anybody to engage in that kind of rhetoric that attacks people like that because it sort of gives free license to the idea of people taking the law into their own hands and committing acts, criminal acts, against people who may be migrants. Um, we see an interesting situation developing on the southern border. Uh, the governor of Texas, Greg Abbott, has recently uh, got through the Texas legislature legislation that basically has deputized his National Guard to be enforcing immigration law. What is your reaction to that, uh, that happening in Florida and perhaps some other states too? So this is one of those many situations that just adds additional complexity and I think frustration with the overall immigration system, the immigration sort of uh, issues, because it just creates more problems, it creates more friction, it creates more tension, and does not actually move towards solving any of the underlying sort of systemic issues with the immigration system. Do you, do you have the impression too, we hear many people describe immigration right now as a national crisis, and they call, there are calls from all political quarters, it seems, including the Biden administration for an orderly process and for immigration reform legislation. Um, in the perfect world, what kind of immigration reform changes would you like to see written into law? How long do you have? Because that's actually one of the, I think, uh, sort of million dollar questions among advocates on, on all sides of the spectrum. But I think certainly one of the ma major issues right now is just the amount of time that it takes for even a single case to go through the system, regardless of what type of case it is. And so one of the many points has been putting more funding into the system to make sure there are more or there are enough ad adjudicators, whether it's immigration judges, USCIS Citizenship and Immigration Office uh, officers, to address all the cases that are currently right. in the system. Because when we tell people we want you to follow the law for coming into the U.S., we want you to follow this orderly process, but we don't have enough immigration judges. And it seems that the Congress has missed some recent opportunities to do something about that. They have. Senator James Lankford of Oklahoma, a very conservative Republican, actually made an effort earlier this year reaching out to Democrats in the U.S. Senate and trying to work with them to craft a so-called bipartisan compromise immigration reform bill, but that was basically shot down by Donald Trump when he said he didn't want it. But didn't, didn't his proposal include more money for administrative law judges, immigration judges to hear cases? Didn't it include more money for additional agents working along the U.S.-Mexico border? That's my understanding, and I think that there are so many forces at play here now that have gone beyond just sort of the immediate idea of legislating around immigration reform that has become increasingly difficult to even see a path forward, mm -hmm. even for a relatively, what I think a lot of people consider sort of a middle of the road, nobody's happy type uh, proposal. Um, and so it's unfortunate. I mean, I think that at base, everybody recognizes there are problems with the immigration system as it currently stands. And we, we all acknowledge the problem, but have not been able to come up with a solution, a concrete solution to it. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I will point out, there has been a lot of discussion around continuing to pour money into whether it's border officials or immigration judges or officers to adjudicate claims. And those, those I think, are, are good measures but don't necessarily address some of the very underlying problems with the system as a whole. Whereas you mentioned, you know, we ask people to go through the correct process, but if the correct process is going to take 20, 25 years in That's some cases, realistic. it's not realistic. Right. And so not addressing that is really just sort of pretending that the problem doesn't exist at, at the base and I, level. I want to ask you too, Julia, further about uh, Governor Abbott and Governor DeSantis of Florida have taken upon themselves recently uh, to bus migrants out of their states to places, other states, where they've made no coordination with the cities or towns or states where they're dropping these people, no provision for accommodations for them or their housing needs or other things which is creating, shifting the burden to those other jurisdictions. 
What's your reaction to that type of approach, this sort of go it alone, we're going to do what we think is good for Texas or Florida? I think it's unfortunate. It is using human lives as basically pawns in a much larger game of whether it's politics or even just sort of um, partisan, what do you want to call it, mm -hmm. pa partisan strategizing or, or anything like that. Um, I think that there are lawsuits that have been starting to come out around some of these issues and obviously those are still in play so what will ultimately come out of those remains to be seen but I think it still also just demonstrates the ripple effect of mm -hmm. a broken immigration system plus different states doing different things around an issue that should be solved federally right because it implicates not only human lives but the companies that right. are providing the buses, the agencies in the states that are affected, the communities in the states that are affected, et cetera. So mm -hmm. really just this ongoing ripple effect. I want to tell our viewers about a documentary which I actually watched on YouTube myself yesterday. On the ILCM website, there is a YouTube link to a really interesting documentary called Indivisible. Tell us about this documentary. What are our viewers going to see if they tune in to watch this documentary? And it's 28 minutes long. It is. And this is basically, it was done uh, to sort of showcase the work and the mission and the values of Immigrant Law Center of Minnesota. And we should say it's, by the way, it's introduced by the actor yes. Sam Watterson, yes. who is very good in the... Uh, in his acting career, had a lot of great success in Law and & Order and other shows. Yes. And he introduces this documentary, doesn't he? He does. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we would encourage, we would love for folks to uh, take a look at that and view it and learn a little bit more about Immigrant Law Center and some of the work and some of the impact we've been able to have. Mm -hmm. I think one of the most outstanding points that comes out of the Indivisible documentary is that actually immigrants, recent migrants, have helped to revitalize a lot of towns in greater Minnesota that frankly were losing population were dying and this new influx of population has led to opening of new businesses on Main Street, new job opportunities for people who live in those areas who are earning an income, paying income tax, sales tax, really revitalizing those, revitalizing those communities, isn't it? That was something that um, really watching that documentary, it really brought that to the fore. Absolutely. I think people, as I sort of alluded to earlier, people often think of immigration as, oh, well, Minneapolis-St. Paul, that's really a, a sort of metro area issue because that's where, you know, most of most folks live. But there is really a burgeoning community of immigrants, refugees, new Americans throughout Minnesota. And in some of these greater Minnesota communities, it is becoming kind of the, the new beating heart of some of these smaller towns. And let's mention some of those towns like Worthington, Worthington. Minnesota, mm -hmm. in Nobles County in yes. the southwest corner of the state, yes. Austin, Minnesota, which home to the meatpacking plant, Hormel mm -hmm. is there, mm -hmm. Moorhead, Minnesota, which yes. sits right across the Red River from Fargo. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really very interesting to see that because I think the documentary Indivisible gives people a look at what some of the motivations are about why people have chosen to come to America, but more specifically, why they've chosen to come to Minnesota to build a life for themselves and their families. Yes, and I think the, the push factors for why people, I think, leave their homes, and I think this is sort of a, a semantic point to some folks, but um, when we talk about immigrants, we talk about refugees, asylum seekers, there is the aspect of them coming to the United States, but there is also the aspect, I think, that people maybe overlook that people are leaving their homes, mm -hmm. whether willingly or not, or because they've been forced to. And that idea of leaving home, I think a lot of us don't really take into account when we're thinking about the immigrant experience. I mean, these people have, you're leaving everything you know behind. And oftentimes, or most times I would say, somebody does not leave their home just for the sake of... I've had conversations home. with people who have said to me, and they often come with their children, of course, they say, how could you walk across the Sonoran Desert or cross the Darien Gap in Panama uh, to try to get to the United States? Why would you do that to your mm -hmm. children? 
Um, and I always think, how desperate must a person be that they would do that? Yes, and I think when the des desperation is really one of the key factors in a lot of the stories of folks who have come to the United States. They're not just economic migrants, but sometimes they're fleeing political violence or persecution in their countries, which gets to the issue of refugees. Yes. There's a standard in refugee law to get refugee status. You have to establish what's called a well, what's the term, a well-established fear of persecution? Well-founded fear of persecution. Well-founded yes. fear of per What does that mean exactly? Give us an example. So when we're talking is, about refugees. Yeah, well, and refugees and asylum seekers, that's, it's the standard is for the same for refugees or asylum seekers. The difference is just whether somebody is outside of the United States seeking it or is inside the United States right. seeking it. Um, for well-founded fear, it can be based on what is called, you know, it, in the law is called past persecution. Mm -hmm. So that would have been past harms, certain types of harms that happened to this person in the past. Uh, and then that leads to, well, I believe or I fear that that's going to happen in the future. Um, it's not a 100% chance it's going to happen, but it also is not a... 1% chance it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So there's a big space in there where the well-funded fear of persecution is being considered. And a judge or a hearing officer has to make a determination whether or not to grant that, basically say that they have a valid fear so that they can come into the U.S. Yes, and I will note, well-funded fear of persecution is just one aspect of mm -hmm. that finding. There are a lot of other legal requirements for a person who is seeking asylum to to be granted. There's that complexity. Again. There is that complexity. Let's talk, uh, we're getting down to our last two minutes here. I want to ask you real quickly, a term that people often hear discussed in the news these days is this idea about birthright citizenship. Former President Trump has called for abolishing birthright citizenship. Many of his supporters support this as well. What is birthright citizenship? Birthright citizenship is the idea that if you are born here on United States soil, you are a United States citizen. And this actually is in the U.S. Constitution, isn't it? Because after the Civil War, black people in America were not considered citizens of the United States. But in the post-Civil War era, Congress passed and the states approved an amendment to the Constitution that said just that. If you're born in the U.S., we don't care whether you came on a slave ship or if your parents brought you across the border in Mexico, if you're born here, you're an American. Yes. Very important to try to keep that, isn't it? Especially if you believe in the Constitution. I mean, I think it's a, it's a pretty base core tenet of uh, the current United States system. And to upend it would have a lot of different consequences. Mm -hmm. a lot of them negative. And would really be a deviation from what we've done historically uh, as a country, at least since the amendment was adopted post-Civil War. Yeah. Any last, last thoughts you want to share with us? We're down the last few seconds here, Julia, about the work of the ILCM. And do you think Congress will ever get its act together and actually pass immigration reform legislation? I wish I could read those tea leaves. Unfortunately, I can't. Uh, I really appreciate taking the time to just talk through a few of these very complex but very important issues with you. Julia, we're going to have to have you back on the program for round two because there is much more to talk about on this subject. Julia Decker, Policy Director for the Immigrant Law Center of Minnesota, a 501c3 nonprofit here. Thank you for being our guest today on Access to Democracy. Thank you.